So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to see you all here. Uh, the one observation that I was able to make, uh, not a lot of uh, young people here. Probably that is a little bit uh, too low level stuff for, for youngsters, but anyways, that, that's good. Somebody joined me on this presentation. So I'll, I'll be talking about uh, U-Boots on uh, quite memory restricted uh, platform. And I call this uh, U-Boots uh, bootloader for IoT platform with a question mark, so we'll see if it is uh, feasible. Uh, so let me start then. Uh, first, uh, I'll start from introduction. My name is Alexei Brodkin. I work for uh, Synopsys as an engineering manager, uh, leading a group of, quite small group of engineers uh, doing development of open source products, uh, projects for uh, Arc architecture. And uh, even if we are not talking about Synopsys, personally, I uh, use open source software a lot in my spare time and uh, uh, doing my day job. Uh, so uh, whenever I face a problem, I uh, try to debug that, uh, fix it, and then I, I then contribute my fixes upstream. So that's how I got involved in a couple of open, open source projects, and uh, some of them are listed here. Uh, the mostly notable of, most notable of them Linux kernel build root, uh, recently I started to contribute on open embedded, but uh, regarding that presentation, what is important, uh, I made a port of U-boot bootloader for Arc architecture a couple of years ago, and uh, since then I've been maintaining that, enhancing and uh, all that. Uh, so that's our agenda for today. I'll start from introduction of, uh, of my target platform that I'm going to talk uh, then I'll uh, explain what uh, I had to do to strip down memory footprint so, so that uh, my uh, U-boot build is uh, usable on that platform. And so then I'll talk a little bit about uh, how to execute U-boot from ROM because by default this is not what usually happens. And uh, in the end I'll go through uh, two issues I faced uh, during first execution of my uh, U-boot port on that board. So let's start then. Uh, U-boot, uh, it is basically a bootloader and is um, its main reason to exist uh, to uh, load some uh, real payload and start it on the board. And uh, typically it would be some kind of OS, it might be RTOS or what at least here we uh, may think of it will be Linux uh, kernel plus uh, rootfs and all that. And initially I added support for AXS uh, one OX board with, which was uh, uh, quite interesting development board, so uh, basically that's it, but with a different CPU. Uh, what was important, it was uh, 600 uh, megahertz uh, CPU with uh, a lot of memory. You see these uh, mentioned two gigabytes of DDR, then I added support of uh, that board with a little bit different CPU, uh, which runs a little bit slower, but still I uh, saw that it is more than enough for running U-boot bootloader. And so then uh, last year uh, we've got a new board which is even more powerful. It is quad core uh, RKHS 38 CPU running at one gigahertz and it has even more memory. And uh, that is a very typical uh, situation when we use U-Boot. It is a so-called uh, single board computer. We use U-Boot there every day. Uh, but uh, there is such a thing uh, which is called low of an instrument or also known as a low of a hammer, which sounds like if you, if all of you, if uh, all you have is a hammer, uh, everything looks like a nail. And so that happens to me in that sense that uh, whatever new boards I uh, have on my desk, I try to port U-boot on that and uh, try to execute it and see if there is some use of that. So that's what happens. Uh, I was, uh, uh, given a new board uh, uh, with idea to use uh, bootloader uh, and uh, package that in a, into a real product that we are going to ship to our users. Uh, that uh, tiny board actually is quite small. It is like, uh, you may see from connectors, it is like three on uh, five centimeters or something like that. So it is called uh, IoT development kit and it, it is meant to be used as a platform for software development and debugging in areas like uh, sensor fusion, voice recognition, face detection, and something else. And idea to use a bootloader was to allow users to run their own applications without additional debugging tools. Like you don't need to use JTAG whatsoever. 
you just uh, build your application, put it on SD cards or on USB storage, plug that into that board, you may see that uh, uh, there is a USB OTG connector and uh, there is SD card connector, but uh, SD card slot, but probably you don't see it on the other side. Uh, and you may just run it without additional tools, which, which at least for me looks quite nice because you don't need any extra. Uh, that basically meant we need we needed a bootloader which may uh, support these peripherals, may support FAT or uh, uh, FAT uh, partition, which is usually used by developers on Windows machines. And so uh, here, I think Uboot uh, is quite a good match. Uh, now, speaking about uh, things which are important for Uboot, uh, like. We see here that CPU runs at 150 megahertz, and from my experience with my previous board, I know that 100 megahertz is more than enough uh, to start U-boot as fast that you don't even recognize that it will be quite fast. Uh, but what differs a lot uh, from previous boards uh, is the amount of memory uh, which is available on this board. So what we have here uh, first is E flash. Uh, this is quite an interesting flash memory which we may use for uh, direct code execution right from it. So that's good and so it is relatively big compared to all the others, uh, but the problem is you cannot write to the random address in this uh, flash. So uh, right there, first you need to erase a page, which means you cannot use it as random access memory. So we may use it for code storage, but we cannot use it for uh, runtime variables and something like that. Then we have ICCM, which stands for Instruction Closely Coupled Memory. Uh, this is interesting on chip memory, which is mostly supposed to be used for code storage. And we may execute code from there, but nobody actually stops us from putting data there as well. And so that's why for us it is pretty much normal, normal random access memory, which is again relatively large here. Uh, then there comes an SRAM. SRAM is SRAM. It is random access memory on chip, uh, but it is quite uh, a bit smaller. And so then he comes to DCCM, which is pretty much the same as ICCM, but this is data closely coupled memory. And there is one but very important difference uh, between them. Uh, DCCM is not connected to instruction fetch queue, which means we cannot execute code from that memory. And which means this is random access memory, but it is not very, uh, very flexible. Uh, and so, so what I'm going to do on that board, I will use flash memory, which is not usable for uh, writing data uh, as a storage for our code uh, constants uh, and initially even data before it gets copied. And I will use uh, DCCM for data, which is used by U-Boot. That gives us possibility to allow user to use ICCM to, uh, for loading uh, their applications and starting that, uh, starting their application from there. And if they want, they may use SRAM as well. But anyway, so once uh, you load some application with U-Boot, you don't need U-Boot any longer and may, you may reuse uh, DCCM as well if you want. Also, we have SPI flash. It is good to, to store something, but again, this is not RAM, so it is not usable. As for peripherals on these boards, we have a plant of them, but in terms of U-Boot, what is important is SD card controller, and this is designed where uh, mobile storage controller, uh, USB OTG, this is designed where oh, USB OTG controller and standard UART. So uh, that's nice, and uh, so why using U-Boot here again? Uh, we have support of pretty much everything here. Uh, you may see a lot of architectures, including ARC, we have support of different peripherals. Uh, we have support of that design where you are. We have support of design where uh, USB on the O controller. And we have support of uh, SD card as well. So nothing to do here. We have support of different file system and so FAT file system is here as well. So again, nothing to be done. Uh, what else? Uh, it supports networking protocols, but we don't have networking on these boards. But anyway, so that's an interesting <coughs> benefit. And keeping all that in mind, it allowed me to add support for this board, uh, create that new port of U-Boot for that board literally in a couple of minutes. And you may see uh, uh, that's a change log of uh, what I had to do. And uh, I tried to highlight a couple of things. So what is important? So you add board here, you add uh, device tree description here, and you add configuration here. So that's 
the minimal stuff you need to, to do anyways for any boards and everything else here. It is only, only required if you need so, to implement some per board so, quirks, uh, which I had to do. But anyways, this was quite simple. Uh, now, uh, I uh, said so that it was a working port. Well, it could have been working with the only uh, important uh, difference is we are not actually feeling in memory that we have. As you may see, resulting binary would be of size 400k, and we cannot uh, squeeze it into 256 uh, kilobytes of uh, ROM that we have. So that basically means we need uh, to do something about it, and uh, we are going to work towards uh, shrinking the memory footprint of that uh, U-boot uh, build. So what we may do, the simplest thing we may do, uh, we may just go and uh, tweak our configuration. Thanks to uh, the fact that uh, for quite some time already, U-Boot uses uh, kconfig, the same configuration utility which is used in Linux kernel. It is a matter of, uh, of firing up that like make menu config and then go through the options and disable stuff that we don't need. So for example, we don't have um, internet controller, so we remove networking. We don't have, uh, we, we are not going to start any operational system, so that's why we get rid of that as well. We are not going to load stuff through serial console because we have uh, peripherals which are much more convenient. And we are not going uh, to load L files because to load L file, you need first to load L file in one memory and then uh, extract uh, sections from this L file to another memory. We don't have uh, enough of memory to play with all that. We expect that user will uh, load binary and just execute it. So we've got uh, it removed and already you may see we have a little bit different number here. So resulting binary will, will be smaller, but still we are not yet there. So what we may do else? Okay, we may try to squeeze a little bit of uh, size uh, with help of a tool chain. I understood that uh, something was missing uh, in our port of view boot and what it was, it was uh, that interesting feature when we ask compiler to put each and every variable and function in a separate section and then we ask linker to throw away those sections which are not referred in any other sections. It is very simple thing, but uh, for some reason, well, I know why, because previously I had way too much memory, so I didn't think about uh, that, uh, so I didn't do that. And so now I added uh, corresponding options in uh, C uh, C CPP flags and LD flags, uh, and if you want, you may uh, click on that commit if you download slides, and so uh, you'll see how it was done. And so then I realized that actually most of the other architectures, they already do that, except Arc and for some reason uh, another architecture where it is not supported is Microblaze. I'm not sure, probably uh, uh, Toolchain doesn't support that because support is required or probably it was never required because they always have a lot of memory. So with that nice thing, I was able to uh, shrink another 5% uh, of uh, size and we are getting even closer, but still we are not yet there. And the interesting thing for me was immediately like you see BSS, which is uh, more than 100 kilobytes. And BSS, it is basically not initialized statically allocated buffers, like what's of that size? Okay, so uh, let's uh, do some analysis and see uh, what that could be. And uh, with very simple NM utility, I was able to figure out, okay, there are two buffers each of which is so 64, uh, 64 kilobytes. And so, well, that was not very good because I was very limited in memory. So uh, when I started to look at them, I realized, okay, oh, they, uh, they are of size of this variable uh, defined, which is defined, fortunately for me, it was another configuration option. So what I did, I went back to configuration utility. I just set another size and boom, I was able to save 100 kilobytes and so already that allowed us uh, to put that uh, resulting image in our ROM and we don't need already a lot of memory for uh, data actually because it is 7K here and 18K here. Uh, a little bit of background, actually that initial value of 64K, this is uh, on a safety uh, side because in theory, a uh, FAT file system may have such a big cluster, but in reality, I don't think there are many cases when it is larger than 4K. 
So 4K is actually quite, quite safe uh, setting. At least for me, I was uh, quite happy with that. But still, by default, it's 64K. Uh, and if you have gigabytes of memory, you don't really care. So looks like uh, uh, we were able to uh, significantly reduce our memory footprint. You see from uh, uh, 422 kilobytes to uh, less than 200 kilobytes, which is quite impressive. And what helped us uh, the most uh, significant result we were able uh, to get after analysis of our resulting binary. And I used just uh, size and NM here, at least that's what I showed. But also during my experiments, I used quite a lot blot on meter. That's a very nice utility which allows you to compare two different ELF files and it will show you how different uh, symbols uh, uh, became bigger or smaller, and uh, what uh, kind, of what, how many, how much of the memory you were able to to save? Like it will show you now you are plus 15 percent compared to what where you were before. Uh, another thing which uh, helped, uh, I was practical. I just removed all the crap that I didn't want to use, and so with some tweaks of a tool chain, I was able to save some space as well. Uh, what could be also tried, it might be LTO link time optimization. I tried to play with it a little bit, but for that I needed to make a bit more changes to uh, you would build system because link time optimization requires uh, to use GCC driver all the time, even when we invoke linker or archiver or anybody else. And so that requires more changes and I didn't expect to get a lot of uh, achievements here and I was already uh, achieving what I wanted to have, uh, so I just decided, okay, probably that will be the next exercise. So, uh, like, we are pretty much done, but uh, there is another thing. We want to use, we want to execute U-Boot solely from ROM. And this is not what usually happens. Uh, usually U-Boot gets self-relocated. Probably not all of you know about that, so, so I, uh, I'll try to uh, show you what happens there. So uh, that's what happens. First, we load uh, U-Boots into some uh, initial location. It might be ROM, it might be even start of the RAM or some other location. And uh, there we load entire image. And then what happens, U-Boot gets uh, uh, copied in the very end of uh, available memory and start to locate uh, needed memory for heaps, stack, uh, uh, environment, and something else. This is required because in, on some platforms, for example, on x86 and on many others, you don't have DDR prepared for usage and you have to set its uh, clocks, you have to train it and to do something else, which means you need to execute from some safe location which is not DDR. For example, in x86, what they do, they lock a couple of cache lines and execute from there. It is not so something people may um, expect to happen, but these hacks are really happening. And uh, then, uh, even if you start from the very beginning of the DDR already, if there was a pre-boot loader, which we have, for example, on our boards that I mentioned before, you want to still move your boot here, because in the beginning of the memory, you'd like to put real payloads, which will occupy entire memory when your boot execution is done. So there are a couple of uh, reasons for your boots to relocate. Well, and actually there is another reason, because our data is still somewhere here, and we cannot write to this area when we are in ROM, which means we still need to relocate at least data, and uh, that will be still a requirement for us. And uh, anyways, uh, that kind of relocation work quite, works quite fine when you have a lot of memory, but in our case, it looks like that. You see the difference? So that's a U-boot bin, and that's our available random access memory, which means most probably we won't be able to copy ourselves together to that area and do something else. So we need to keep everything that we can in ROM and only put required stuff in RAM area. So what we need there? We need to have heap there essentially stack data uh, environments and we will uh, load payload. But we are not going to squeeze payload here because we have a, a separate location for that. But so uh, that's just for generic case. Uh, and for that to happen, what we need uh, to do, we need to, uh, to skip relocation. Uh, even though it uh, sounds quite simple, it requires quite a few uh, architecture-specific uh, fixes and generic codes. It doesn't work right away. Uh, because different code paths uh, should be used, and even though there is a generic flag which, may, which we may uh, use to say that we want to skip, but then we still need to have a couple of defines here and there. 
Again, uh, if you download these slides, you may have that uh, link where you may find uh, all the changes I had to do. Actually, not that many, but anyways, that had to be done. Uh, so once we have that modification, we signal in our early platform code that we don't want to do that relocation and we only will do some data copy later on. And so then we may execute from, uh, from real ROM. And uh, let's see what we need to do. Uh, initially, we have our entire U-boot bin. So where is the pointer? Okay. Uh, initially, this is our ROM, and so we have everything here. We have interrupt vector table, we have uh, text section here, we have raw data, and even data here, because this is our initial U-boot bin, because data, it, it is initialized data. We cannot just get rid of that. We need to still uh, have it even before we start execution. And then we need to, to copy data somewhere in our RAM. It, is, it sounds simple uh, thing, but uh, there are two questions we need to answer first. first uh, question is, okay, so we need to copy data, but where are we going to copy that? Because we have uh, a relatively large RAM and at which location, in the beginning, in the end, or where? The second question, okay, so how can, can we uh, have such a strange situation when Linker creates you would be with data here, but then we move somewhere and from this code, we still may refer to variables, for example, in, in uh, that area in completely different memory region. Uh, so let's try to answer that. So to answer the first question, we need to, uh, to understand what Yubu does during initialization in terms of memory allocation. First thing it does, it uh, essentially allocates its space for itself if we are going to relocate. So somewhere here, it would be a uh, place for uh, entire U-boot uh, binary. And in fact, it was happening even if we signaled that we wanted uh, to relocate. If we wanted to... Uh, to not relocate. So I had to, to change that and so not relocate that again. For bigger platforms with more memory, we don't care, we allocate here 200 kilobytes, here 200 kilobytes, and don't care. But here I have to be uh, very careful. Then uh, once that allocation done or not done, we allocate space for environment. And we know the size of that allocation because it is specified in our uh, configuration here. You see config underscore, it is either, either kconfig uh, variable or uh, something set in our configuration header. Then we allocate uh, space for uh, malloc, uh, we sometimes call it heap, and again, we know its uh, length already. And uh, also what is important, we need to allocate somewhere space for a stack, and this is done by simply pointing in, uh, to initial stack uh, pointer allocation. And in my uh, implementation, I decided to put it here in the very beginning of the RAM. And so uh, there, is, there is a good reason for that. And so on the next slide somewhere, I will explain what was the beauty of putting stack here. So from that uh, picture, I think that's clear. So if we use that value, which we all, anyways, as I mentioned, uh, set in configuration uh, header, we may use it as a point uh, uh, where we load data. So that problem is solved. And answering the second question, how we uh, deal with data which is linked here, but so uh, then copy it here, it turns out that uh, GCC, uh, uh, GNU LD may already do that, and they use concept of different uh, virtual address and uh, load address. If you are interested, again, you may follow that link and get uh, some more information. But uh, what do we need to do for that? Unfortunately, that's not the very good position for me. Uh, so first, we define two different memory regions. So, so this is a ROM, and so we set its origin, origin and size. And this is RAM. Again, we set origin and size. And then for each and every section, we tell Linker where to put it. So for example, IVT, text, and raw data we put in ROM, and that's the interesting part. We ask Linker to put data in RAM, but then put it in ROM. And what happens, we use addresses which are, which match those uh, addresses. So compiler used some addresses so to access uh, stuff in that uh, section, but linker will put it in a different uh, area in expectation that it will be copied to uh, virtual addresses that we used during compilation, later on during execution startup. And so, uh, yeah, and then there is a BSS section, which we don't put somewhere in, ra in ROM because we don't need it there. And it won't even appear in our U-boot bin because BSS, it is nothing. We will just 
allocate some memory region in the runtime and we'll zero it. So we don't need to mess with that. What is also important here, uh, we put a couple of uh, link time defined symbols. For example, this is RAM start, RAM end, uh, BSS start, BSS end. This will be required, and so this one is also important, by the way, uh, ROM end. This will be used uh, for runtime uh, to, uh, tricks we are going uh, to do early on start. And here you may see how I calculated uh, a couple of uh, different values. Uh, so uh, it, need, it requires uh, some time to understand what's going on there. So I uh, wanted to do that thing. So RAM data size, this is not the entire size of the RAM, but uh, this is size avail uh, which will be used by exactly, uh, where's the pointer? Data, BSS, heap, and environment. So, so this is that area, but not entire RAM and uh, some other variables. And so that's what we have uh, in memory layout if we uh, use uh, variables or constants we define by a linker. Uh, you see, uh, this is ROM based, so this is quite clear. It was a text base before. Uh, this is ROM ends, and this is important because that's real address uh, where data exists before uh, copy. So that's the place where we use uh, to start copying data. And here you see RAM start is a location where we're going to copy. So basically, we copy in a cycle everything from here to here. And so we know the size as well. We may calculate it even uh, during compilation, and so that is very simple. And we know uh, as well a location of BSS, so we may easily zero it later on. And that's what we need to do basically. First we set that uh, flag, GD flag skip reloc, and uh, so I'm, I'm doing that here, and note to the name of the function, which is executed very early, early on uh, startup. So we signal uh, that we are not going to relocate uh, then we copy data with use of those symbols that we defined previously. And so uh, finally, we zero uh, BSS. Actually, it is not entirely correct. It will happen in a different function. So I put it here as a matter of a demonstration. But this step happens anyway, so even if we do relocation. So uh, looks like we're ready for the first execution of U-boot on our board. And so, uh, yeah, and now we are going to execute it and see what's going on. So, in fact, console works, but uh, not everything working as expected. So, we want to start uh, using USB, and first thing you need to do, you say USB start. And what happens? Well, it says error minus 12. Like, what? Okay. And error minus 12, essentially, this is in our mem, which means we don't have uh, enough memory during allocation in our uh, heap area. And so what helps here, if we take a look at our backtrace, uh, we may see a couple of interesting things. So uh, we start uh, USB initialization, then we do device probe, and then we do allocate pre, which at least for me hinted that uh, each device has its own uh, private structure which is used for a storage of device-specific information. And I uh, thought, OK, so if I look at uh, a corresponding driver at its private structure, probably there is something interesting. And indeed, I see there is some buffer of size, uh, DWC data buff size. OK, and if we look at its definition, we see that indeed this is another 40, 64K. And, uh, then after quite a short discussion with Marek, uh, he hinted me that actually this is not a strong uh, requirement. This is a uh, buffer which is used for data exchange uh, via USB, and we actually make it, we may make it much smaller, and even if we want to transfer a larger amount of data, it will be just split in a smaller buffer, so that's fine. And so, so what I did then, then I uh, added another kconfig option which allows you to fine tune that value to whatever you want. So 64K was uh, way too much for me, so I uh, set 16K, and so since then it was uh, working perfectly fine. What helped here, uh, that I was able to uh, look at the backtrace uh, and, uh, well, actually some knowledge on how uh, a driver uh, drivers work in uh, modern U-boots. And so this driver is a uh, uh, DM, so what is it, right? driver, driver. driver model implementation. Because if you use legacy implementation, it will work a little bit differently. 
So now when we get that uh, thing fixed, I faced another issue when I tried to access finally FAT's uh, file system. So uh, what I saw, it was uh, uh, quite interesting because nothing happened. So fortunately, I have access uh, through JTAG to that board and I saw, okay, I'm in memory exception. So how come that memory exception uh, happened? And uh, so then I uh, took a look at registers and what I noticed that my stack pointer register, which, uh, which is a separate register, at least on our CPUs, pointing way outside of our RAM area. And if you return uh, to that slide, you see, so it was pointing somewhere here. And that is the beauty of the stack being here because there is no memory here and my memory subsystem just returned an exception. If I uh, have put that uh, stack area some, some, somewhere here, for example, after data, you may imagine what would happen. I would silently start to corrupt my data and somewhere later down the line, like during execution of something else, I would face significantly uh, more, uh, significantly uh, worse situation uh, when I need to debug something which might not even be reproducible easily. So that's why uh, you either put it here and expect an exception here to get when you access in this area, or if you have like uh, memory protection units, uh, you may uh, use it as well. It will definitely help. Uh, yes, so uh, also what uh, may, may be used as a hint. Uh, so yeah, uh, we, are, we understood what was the reason. So then, uh, well, not the reason, what's happened. And what was the reason? Again, if we look at a backtrace, we see that last function which was execution is part test DOS. And in that function, if we look at that, we see in the very beginning allocation on stack indeed of something. This is a couple of macros which are wrapped around each other and so in the end, so that thing, if simplified, looks like that. So what it, what it does, it allocates memory of uh, size of that structure multiplied by amount provided here. And here sector size is uh, 512, 512 bytes. And so it is like uh, what it is, 78. And if we multiply that, we get uh, 40 kilobytes. But if we look at that function, uh, at that function a little bit uh, uh, down, we see that actually what we want to do, we just want to see file system magic number, which occupies like a couple of bytes. We don't need actually four, uh, 40 kilobytes here. And when I took a look at the Git history, I understood that so there was a previous fix that changed the location function uh, from uh, something else, and semantics of that function was different. And actually, what that guy wanted to do, he wanted to put here one, because we want to allocate only size of that structure. And uh, with that fix, which is mentioned here as well, I've got this problem resolved, resolved as well. And so from that exercise, I concluded that you have to be very careful when you see something like that, because if your memory can uh, restrict it a lot, uh, you may allocate that here a little bit more than you expected. So in the end, I've got a working system, and so those goals so that were uh, uh, mentioned in the beginning, uh, they were met, so you may now load image, start it, and uh, play with that, uh, with anything. And basically, the main conclusion of all that exercise is Ubud is perfectly usable on a platform with uh, not that uh, much of a memory. Like for this particular case, I was able to squeeze it into 200 kilobytes of ROM and 100 kilobytes of RAM. And still with that, I've got drivers for serial ports, USB, MMC, and support of a fat file system, not even for reading, but for writing as well, because we uh, expect a user to keep environment on SD cards or a USB storage. And uh, if you have uh, uh, tools that uh, really helps a lot when you are trying to analyze uh, uh, where you may strip down uh, memory a little bit more, uh, still, uh, sometimes you need uh, to either enhance existing generic uh, U-boot codes or sometimes even fix stuff because things are done wrong in some places. But anyways, that helps. And uh, what also is good to remember that uh, uh, when you are fighting with a uh, limited memory situation, allocation happens not only statically during compilation but in runtime as well. And it, it happens not only in heap but in stack as well. And it is very it is always a very uh, complicated problem when you have uh, Stack Overflow. Uh, 
Another thing uh, that I want to mention in that particular situation, you need to bypass uh, U-boot relocation and unfortunately that requires some work. If you are not using ARC architecture, which most probably you don't uh, do because uh, there are not that many boards with that architecture, but hopefully at some point uh, people start using it more. Uh, you need uh, to patch uh, code and uh, hopefully send patches uh, in upstream as well. And so, yeah, the last conclusion is uh, most of runtime problems are due to problems with memory. Uh, so I think that's uh, pretty much it that I wanted to tell you about so my excursion with U-Boot on that platform. Thank you all for being here and also leaving me here alone in the middle of the session. Any questions so far? Yeah. At the very beginning, you start removing some features unnecessary, and you removed an ability to boot any operating system. So, yeah. what this bootloader will do after it will boot? So, what's well, the purpose? The world uh, doesn't tend on the operating system, right? Mm -hmm. The point is, you built your bare metal application, which does, I don't know, uh, sensor fusion, whatever. And it is uh, 100k in size, I mean, entire binary. You may produce with a uh, compiler not only ELF file or U image, you may build image, uh, binary image of your application. Then you load it into uh, memory, so if we return even further, uh, so you load it, it's, uh, what is my pointer? So you load it, uh, say here, your application and execute it and do whatever you want. With U-Boot, uh, on U-Boot parlance, what you do, you say uh, fat loads mmc0 my cool app dot bin and provide address. And uh, then what you do, you say go to the same address. And what happens, U-Boot just jumps to that location and starts to execute your application. Uh -huh. From this point, there is no U-Boot any further, further, further. It might still exist somewhere, but you pass control to a different application. And so that's the reason uh, for bootloader to exist. So this option doesn't prevent from running a bare metal, no, raw binaries. Sorry? So this option doesn't prevent you boot to, from running a bare executables, right? Again, what is the question? This option doesn't prevent uh, you boot to no. run... No, th that is a very specific option which uh, does quite a lot of things in preparation for starting Linux uh, kernel. Uh, yeah, and then uh, loading uh, stuff or changing like device tree blob if it is, and then uh, doing a lot of checks, uh, prepares registers, caches, and then passes control. Go command is very simple. It is uh, implemented as jump. Okay. Thank you. I have a really uh, simple question. Uh, how small can you actually make U-boot be the binary? Can you strip it down, say, to uh, 64 kilos? Is that possible? Is there some mechanics well, for that? Uh, yeah, you see uh, what I had to do here. Uh, I had so those limitations. Right. And fortunately, I actually, in the beginning, I was not 100% sure, but I said, OK, I will do that. And fortunately, I was able to squeeze uh, what I have in uh, what I wanted in what I have. But uh, can we go even further? So uh, if you take a look at... Uh, yeah, so if, if you like remove slide. the USB from it, the file system and so yeah. on, how, how small can you get? Well, I need to try. Again, I had to implement something which supports both SD and USB and essentially it takes a special USB, I think. It, and file system, it adds quite a lot. But then the question is, if we remove all the peripherals and leave only U-boot core, why do we need that? Um, it's just a thought experiment, really. How small can you get? Uh, well, yeah, so we may... St well, actually, there, there are systems ha that have uh, SRAM limitations. No. And you need to load you boot into that and execute it. But, but for that case, we have, you know, SPL. We have uh, all those tricks which will strip down all the print case, uh, print apps and all that. So, yeah. That, that will be the thing I would use in that situation, that's for sure. Can you speak about that a little bit, about SPL? Well, it was not implemented here because it is not what we wanted, because SPL is not meant to be used as a full-blown bootloader that we wanted. It does one simple thing, but I think you know it better than me, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're kidding. No, I actually want you to, to say it in, to the audience uh, about ah, SPL. Okay. All that. 
So I'm, the, the I'm trying to guide the you there. Spoiler is uh, we may have very even more stripped down U-boot, which does only one thing that uh, we want it to do. It loads from only one media, uh, typically, and uh, doesn't uh, throw uh, debug messages. But it is very tiny, so it could be fit in like one page of uh, something. And for example, on, I think on IMX platform, what they do, they have SPL, which fits into one page of memory, like 4K or something. No, it's uh, 32 or so. Oh, 32. Well, anyways, it, it is quite, quite, quite small. I do believe you can make a boot as small as one jump instruction. No, no. And what Marek was uh, uh, saying about it is a practical thing because what happens, uh, you have a multi-stage uh, boot. Multi First, you have Bootron, which actually does uh, pretty much nothing. It might be a couple of uh, lines of code which copy stuff, for example, from SPI uh, word by word. Then you start execution from the first page, or from, for example, uh, as on x86, you have cache lines in which you lock, you load, and you have 32 bits K, no, long, no more. Then you start execution from there, and then with SPL, you initialized your DDR, and then you may uh, load real full-scale U-boot from SD card from that DDR because you already have driver for uh, SD card and file system, which you are not able to have in a pre-boot loader because you only had a couple of uh, lines of code there. So you see, on each stage, we are becoming more and more powerful, and in the end, we may do whatever you want. So that's a beauty. Hi. Uh, so what's your uh, long-term plan here for maintenance? Is it all going to be upstream? It is already there. It's already upstream. Okay. And are you going to maintain the, these options going well, ahead? These options? Which options do the you The options to be able to strip off uh, different features and strip off... Uh, well, you can strip features yourself. That's, uh, that's configuration for your boards. Well, that's my board. That's my configuration. If somebody wants me to add another feature, okay, I may add it. If somebody says that we don't need USB there any longer, I will just strip it down. Essentially, I will support that because uh, I'm a maintainer of archi architecture. That's my board, so it's my responsibility. That's my sort of a child. Uh, the framework related to this stuff as well, where you uh, create each symbol, each symbol goes to a different section and then you strip off at the linking time where you realize what the symbols which are not being referenced anywhere and then you strip it, off, you strip it off. I would guess that will be at somewhat more framework level rather than your platform port. Yeah, as I told, uh, it should be generic feature, but probably back in the day it was not supported. I know that for ARC it was not supported a couple of years ago and so then it became supported by I only added that feature now because again, for previous uh, solutions it was not needed, I had enough memory. And for, for example, Microblaze, we may ask uh, Mitchell Simic, I, I think I saw him, if, if he just uh, didn't uh, think about that, probably that's the reason. And if uh, it is possible to be done on Microblaze, then it is no-brainer. We should get it into generic code. And actually, that's a good idea, but first we need to, to figure out what's wrong with Microblaze. So yeah, that's the next step, indeed. Thank you very much.